Okay, so what I want to do is to, to dive into this passage, not so much going to walk through um, line by line, but just want to pick some principles out of the passage that Paul is trying to, to teach us. Um, again, not maybe di diving into all of the details of what he says, but just trying to uh, get the, the overview, if you like, of what he's trying to say to us here. And I want to tie all of it together. I think all of the principles in this passage all come from a heart of what it means uh, what true biblical love really is and so I, I know I'm sure we've heard this uh, a number of times already but I'm going to go back over it again just to remind us uh, because it is that important uh, what real biblical true biblical love is is so vital for us as we seek to live and walk as Christians because we know, don't we, that the world has this kind of view of love. And that view of love is, is a little bit wishy-washy, if we're honest. It's all about falling in and out of love. Uh, we all know the scenes in the movies. We've watched a few films over Christmas and we watched them. Um, Bride and Prejudice the other day, not my choice, I must um, say, um, but uh, interesting nonetheless. And you have this moment at the beginning of the, the film where uh, Mr. Darcy and uh, the Indian version of uh, Elizabeth, whatever the surname is, I've forgotten it. That's a good thing, isn't it? I don't know that much about Bride and Prejudice. Um, what I do know is because my mum and my sister and Sarah and the girls all watch it which means I can't get away from it anyway you have this moment when Mr Darcy sees the girl across the crowded marriage and their eyes meet and you know from that point on that they're destined to to get together don't you now that's ridiculous absolutely ridiculous I'm not saying nothing like that ever happens but that isn't real love is it that's just a moment something happens uh, you fall in some kind of love and then maybe it develops that isn't what real love is maybe that's what the world sees but that isn't what the Bible presents as real love. Real love is not just an emotion. It's not just a feeling. It's not just something that comes and goes as quickly as the, the weather changes. It's something you choose to do. That's what real love is. Uh, not saying all the emotion and feeling and stuff is wrong. Of course, that's part of it. But for real love to flourish, that emotion and feeling needs to grow up into a decision to love somebody. That's what real love is. A definition of real love could be this. It's doing the best for somebody, regardless of what it costs you. Doing the best for somebody else, regardless of what it costs you. And so it means to make a choice, I'm going to love a person, whether I feel like it or not. Actually, that's how you can love your enemies. If love was a feeling, you'd never be able to love your enemies because you're never gonna feel anything for them, but you can choose to love your enemies. And that's why Jesus tells us, to do it. And so all of this that we're going to look at today comes back to this heart of what real biblical love is. It's to make a choice to do the best for somebody, not just to feel good about them, but to do something for them, to make a choice. I'm going to love you, whether it's easy or hard, whether the results are good or bad, whether it's painful for me or whether it's I get off scot-free. It doesn't matter. I'm going to do what's best for this other person. And so that's at the heart of everything we're going to look at today. And the first point I just want to bring out is this, that love for God is the highest goal. Love for God is the highest goal. And Paul communicates that to us, doesn't he? And he kind of does that. And it's going to go on and say more about this next, next week. So I don't want to steal um, whoever's preaching next week's thunder too much. But he basically presents this idea that where he says, do you know, guys, a lot of this is about marriage, but I kind of rather that none of you were married. Now, why, why does he say that? Um, well, he says it because uh, he explains later on that when you're married, you have concerns of things in this world. When you're married and you've got a family, you automatically have to look, uh, think about and spend time on and energy and commitment to looking after the family that God has, has given to you. And, and what that does, Paul says, is that can take you away from serving God. Now, what he's not saying is that marriage and family are bad things. Of course he's not. They're good things. They're given by God, in fact. But what he's saying is that I kind of rather that the, the best thing would be if you remain single. And when you remain single, your whole attention can be on loving and serving God. That's what he's teaching us. If you're single and you don't have the, the, uh, the weight of a family around you, 
Um, you, your whole attention can be on doing what God has called you to do. Now, if you're married, God has called you to be in that relationship. And so uh, then that is what God has called you to do. But uh, we see the point that Paul is saying, if, if you don't have that, then you are free. Every moment of your day can be committed to God. And that's what love is, isn't it? It's saying everything I have is laid down for you and for all of us, regardless of whether we're married, single or whatever, that the highest goal is to lay down everything we are and everything we have for him, uh, to give everything we are to him. That's what real biblical love is. Not a feeling of love for God, although that's important but a decision that I'm going to lay everything down for him, give my life to him. And Paul simply says that's so much easier when you're single. That's so much easier when you don't have all of the concerns of this life weighing you down. But what I find interesting about this is, is the fact that Paul makes it very, very clear that not all of us can reach that goal. So he kind of gives us the best. This is what I want for all of you is to be single and to be free to serve God above everything else. But he accepts that not all of us can get to that place. Not all of us have the self-control and the gift to live in that place. That's what Paul says, isn't it? And so, and he's kind of, he's content with that. And I think that's really important for us to get in our heads. Sometimes we look at kind of other people, don't we? And, and places where that they're at in their walk with God. And, and, and we're like, I wish I could, I could reach that place. The reality is not all of us can reach that place because we just don't have the gift to do it and that's okay that's okay there shouldn't be this pressure that I have to be the very best looking at other people comparing with them thinking I fall short no who we have to be and it's very cliche isn't it but we just have to be ourselves be the person that God has made you to be <laughs> That's all he wants from us, not to live someone else's life, not to have their gift, not to be as spiritual as they are, simply to do what God has given you to do and do that to the best of the gifting and ability that he has given to you. And I do think that's really important for us to grasp. Not everyone can do everything. We hear it all the time in the world, don't we? You can be anything you want to be. No, you can't. You can't. Do you know when I find that most ridiculous? I don't really watch it, but some people do, I know. When you look at these programmes like Britain's Got Talent, and they get up there, don't they? And what I don't know how many acts you have in a series of Britain's Got Talent, but you have, what, 20 or 30 get on the stage? And loads of them, it seems to me, at the brief times I've watched it, they get up and at the end of their thing, they, they want to say, look, guys, you can be anything you want to be. You can be up on this stage just like we are if you work hard enough, if you try hard enough. Just, just think about that for a second. How many people watch Britain's Got Talent? I don't know, 15 million people. Can you imagine if every single one of those 15 million people worked hard enough to get up on stage in the next series of Britain's Got Talent? It would last forever. And it would completely take away the whole point of being famous because everyone would be famous and then you're not famous. So anyway, it's rubbish, isn't it? You can't be anything you want to be. Now, don't get me wrong, hard work, commitment, dedication, you can achieve a lot but you can't be anything you want to be. We should get rid of that kind of idea really and say, Lord, I wanna be who you've made me to be. I wanna be, again, I feel like I'm spouting loads of cliches here, but I wanna be the best person you, you, can, you have made me to be. Um, I feel like that almost comes out of Joel Osteen book and it doesn't because I've never read him. But um, I hope we get the point. We can't be anything we wanna be. We wanna be the people that God has created us to be and so love for God is the highest goal love for God is the highest goal of all of our lives is to lay everything we have wherever we're at down for him not all of us can get to maybe the highest goal that Paul wants for people but we can do the best we can at the place where God has called us to be so that's the first point second point is this this kind of biblical love is at the heart of what marriage is is really all about um, and so Paul is, is given this um, advice, if you like, this counsel to married couples. And, and what he does is he goes to the most 
intimate place in a marriage relationship and he speaks to that and he basically communicates to them this whole idea of of real biblical love and what he's saying to them is this even when you get into the most intimate part of your relationship what you should be doing is looking out for the other person's needs not your own that's what he says that your goal should be to to please and to do good for and to serve and to bless your spouse that's what marriage should be all about it isn't about going into that place and saying i need to have what i need to have and you can translate this principle to pretty much every area of every relationship we ever have in life now it works out a little differently obviously when you're not married to a person but still the attitude should be the same we go into a situation not saying what can i get what can i receive what can you do for me but we go into a situation saying what can i give how can i serve how can I best bless this person who I'm coming into contact with today? That's the attitude of real biblical love, is to give yourself away for the good of the other person. And that's what Paul says the standard is. That's what we should be doing uh, in our marriages, but also in life as we live together as God's people and with those outside the church. He, he goes uh, obviously quite far when he speaks about the marriage relationship and it has echoes doesn't it of the fact that we're bought with a price and and that is where the first point comes from we're, we're bought by God he's shed his blood for us we belong to him and so we need to lay our lives down for him and then Paul talks about this marriage relationship being linked together so strongly that you you, you belong to each other and therefore it is your responsibility to serve the one whom you belong to but like I say that principle it, it reaches into every area of life every single relationship we should be going into this this uh, with this attitude of how can I serve how can I give and and let's be real H how would things change if we went into every area of our lives asking how can we serve how would our church what would our church look like if all of us came into our church lives saying what can I give rather than what can I get not coming into church on a Sunday and let's get away from Zoom for a minute, but coming in and saying, oh, you haven't played that song that I liked, haven't played songs that I, I love, you haven't um, preached in a way that made me feel feel good, you haven't done this, you haven't done that, it's too cold, it's too, it's whatever. All the stuff that we say, and, and not, not, not all those complaints are completely unjustified, um, but what if we came in saying, what can, I, what can I give? It isn't about what I can just receive this morning, it's about what I can give and how I can serve those around me. Uh, our church would be, I'm, I'm sure we do that to a certain extent, but if we do it more and more, our church would be an incredible place to live and to worship together. And as we go out into the world, this isn't the way of the world, is it? Let's be honest. There aren't many people around us just saying, how can I help? How can I serve? maybe on the surface some people seem like that but deep down inside we know that the heart is 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 deceitful and people in the world they do want the best for themselves they do look after number one first and that's me um, and if we go into the world and we can show a different way will that not prompt questions will that not prompt people to look and, and ask why uh, and maybe to see that it's a better way and ultimately be led towards the source of that better way, which is Jesus, the one who laid down his life for us, who came not to be served, but to serve. And so this attitude of love is at the heart of biblical marriage, as well as every other relationship that we have. And then secondly, in this kind of about when we're talking about marriage, it's the reason that biblical marriage is meant to last. Paul talks about that as well, uh, that the, the, the way that God set marriage up is that it's supposed to be forever. It is supposed to be, as our vows say, till death do us part. That's the idea of it. What God has joined together, let not man separate. And so Paul gives this charge to them that the wife shouldn't separate from the husband, the husband shouldn't divorce his wife. Now we know we live in a broken world and these things happen. And the beauty of being a Christian is that even when things go wrong, there is forgiveness and there's grace and there's a second chance. But the intention of marriage is that it lasts all the way until death do us part. And that can only come from this place of real love. You see, 
conflict tends to come, doesn't it, when we're looking out for ourselves. So when we get wronged, we, uh, I see this all the time in the work that I do day by day and, and not so much in marriages, but just in life. When we get wronged, we feel like then we have this justification to go out and treat the person who's wronged us uh, badly, basically, but they deserve it. And so it's OK to, to do that. Um, and then what happens is it escalates because you treat the other person badly and then they feel like they have a justification to treat you badly. And, and it just gets worse and worse and worse and it, and it grows bigger and bigger and bigger until things are just ready to explode. And isn't that when marriages break down, when they're at that kind of boiling point often? Um, but God is trying to show us here a better way uh, and not a way where we say, right, I have the right to treat someone badly because they've treated me badly. But he says to us, well, when someone treats you badly, love them anyway, do the best for them anyway, lay your life down for them anyway. And that isn't going to solve all the problems. Don't get me wrong. I'm not saying everything's going to be hunky dory just because we do that. But you can see how that changes the picture completely. It doesn't escalate everything into this big explosion. But love can turn away wrath, can't it? A soft answer can turn away wrath. Love can cover a multitude of sins and so if we have that attitude and if both parties have that attitude there is no way that anything in this world can ever break that that unity apart that marriage apart N nothing can do it if both both uh, sides if you like say i'm going to love you whatever happens whether you wrong me or, or what however difficult it is however painful it might be uh, i'm going to do what's best for you then nothing can tear that apart it's only when we start to have these conflicts of uh, I need to have my needs met and you need to do better for me and I need to make sure that happens. That's when things go wrong. And so hopefully we can see that if we have this attitude of love, which says I'm going to serve you, whatever happens, regardless of what it costs me, regardless of what it feels like, that is the glue that will stick our marriages together. Biblical love is at the heart of biblical marriage. It's the reason that it will last as God intended it to last. So love for God is the highest goal. Love is at the heart of biblical marriage. It's for the reason that biblical marriage is meant to last. And then next point, and changing tack a little bit now, the love of God means he'll protect us wherever we find ourselves. And so this is moving on to kind of verses 12 to 16 of the passage that we read. And it deals with a kind of classic objection, I think, and I've had this thrown at me a few times. And the objection is this. If you lay down your life for someone all the time, if you always do what's best, regardless of how they treat you, aren't you just making yourself a doormat? And surely we're not supposed to be making ourselves doormats. And to that, I've thought about an awful lot, because like I say, it has been thrown at me quite a bit. Um, and, and I have to say, I've come to the conclusion that, do you know what? Sometimes as Christian, we, we are supposed to be doormats. Just look at Jesus. Look at the way that he responded when he was on trial, unfairly, illegally. He'd done nothing wrong. And they went through this whole progression of throwing uh, false accusations at him and then beating him and flogging him and putting crown of thorns on his head, uh, mocking him for who he claimed to be. And ultimately, we know they hung him up on a Roman cross. Now, at any time, the Bible tells us he could have called down a legion of angels to obliterate the people doing that to him. Now, I guess we don't have that luxury, and, and that's probably a good thing because we'd probably use it if we did. Um, but Jesus didn't. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter. He allowed himself to be mistreated. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying that there's never a time to seek after justice. I'm not saying there's never a time to stand up when people are being wronged, uh, going through the proper channels. Um, but I'm saying we need real wisdom because there's not a principle that says you should never be a doormat. Actually, sometimes we need to lay down and allow people to walk all over us because that's what love is. And that's the measure. Not whether I'm being a doormat or not being a doormat. The measure is, am I loving the person? Uh, and sometimes love is to stand up in their face and say, stop that and do whatever it takes to get them to stop that. And sometimes it's just to allow it to happen. Do you know, the Christian life's hard, isn't it? Because that doesn't make things simple for us. It would be so much easier if I could just say, look, do A or do B. But the, the reality is we need wisdom. In every situation, do I take it or do I stand up against it? And we need 
Holy Spirit inspired wisdom to know what to do in those kinds of situations. But the objection, it seems to me, is this. Uh, the church in Corinth, uh, they had obviously some people there who were married to unbelievers. And maybe they're asking the question, look, if, I, if I'm married to an unbeliever and I have this kind of attitude and I just kind of sit there and, and take whatever they throw at me, then I'm going to be taken advantage of. Things are going to turn out badly for me. And Paul says, no, it isn't, because God is there on your side and he's protecting you. There seems to have been this big question about the children. So if I'm in a, a kind of unbalanced marriage, one believer and, and one not, then, then surely that's going to have an effect on my kids. And, and God says, no, God's, uh, I'm going to look after your kids, despite the fact that, that maybe your partner is, is unbelieving. Because you're there, your kids are separated to me, whatever that means. We won't get into the details right now, but I'm going to protect them. That's clear, isn't it? I'm going to look after them. And I think that can apply across the board. If you, by loving someone, put yourself in a position of vulnerability and weakness, you don't have to worry because God is on your side. He'll look after you. He'll protect you. He's your keeper. He's your strength and he's your shield. And so however that applies, trust him. Trust him. Trust him enough to make yourself vulnerable. Trust him enough to love even when it might hurt. And the love of God means he'll protect us wherever we find ourselves. And then the last point, the love of God means we don't need to seek for more in life just to be obedient. This is going on a bit and it's changing subjects slightly, but it still relates. Uh, verses 17 and onwards, there's this question coming from the, the Corinthians about uh, when they've come to faith, do they need to kind of change uh, their situation in life? And so the two things are this, that they're saying, well, maybe I need to join a, another a religious kind of group and uh, uh, I find it quite bizarre we won't again get into the details but some of them are saying well I'm circumcised I need to become uncircumcised I don't know how that works some were saying I'm not circumcised I need to be circumcised but what they're talking about is joining a different religious group and a religious tradition it's the same kind of stuff that we have around us today which says if you're a true christian you'll always read the king james bible or if you're a true christian you'll wear a suit to church or if you're a true christian you'll do this and do that and let's be very careful not just to point out at other people that we'd see as hyper traditional um we could say stuff like if you're a true christian you'll always raise your hands when you worship none of those things are true are they and this comes back to what Jim was talking to us about last week, the fact that we as God's people are complete in him and don't need to go seeking for any kind of change of status or anything like that in life. All we need to do, Paul says, is not seek to join another religious sect or group who are more spiritual than another. We just need to do what God tells us to do. Verse 19, neither circumcision counts for anything nor uncircumcision, but keeping the commandments of God, just doing what he says. Not changing your status, but doing what God has told you to do. And then um, he goes on to talk about a kind of status in terms of society. And so those who were slaves were kind of pushing for maybe they want to raise themselves up the ladder in terms of their position in society and get free from being a slave. Because who wants to be a slave? And Paul says, no, it doesn't. It doesn't matter just because you're a Christian doesn't mean you need to climb to a higher plane of, of social um, status. You're complete in Christ already. And so you don't need to do that. You can be happy wherever you are, whether the very top of the tree or the very bottom of the tree. You're complete in him. And so don't seek to this change in status. And all of us can learn from that, can't we? Again, all of us can look around and say, I'd, I'd rather be like them or like them or be in this place or that place. No, right where you are right now, whoever you are, wherever your position in society, you're complete in Christ. Whatever religious kind of tradition you might feel you belong to, you're complete in Christ and you can rest in that. And our goal should be not to change our status, but to love, because isn't that what the commandments of God are? The commandments of God are this, love God with all your heart, soul, mind and strength and love your neighbour as yourself. That's what we need to focus on. And that's what all of our lives should be um, built around is this question is if is what I'm doing loving to the people around me? Not have I joined the right sect or the right group? Not am I in the right place in society? But am I loving the people wherever I'm at? 
in whatever way God has given me to do it? That's the question, because love is at the heart of everything we are as Christians. And so Paul says, be content. Be content where you're at. If you're a slave and you get a chance to be free, by all means, do it. I'm sure that relates back to the fact it's probably easier to worship God as a free person than it is as a, as a slave. Um, but, but if you can't, then don't worry about it. Because even as a slave, you are complete in Christ. And all you need to do is to love those around you in any way he gives you to do so. And trust him that you've been bought with that same price that everyone else has been bought with. You're just as valuable as anyone else uh, and live, flourish in that freedom that God has given to you. And so the heart of all these issues is love. Firstly, our love for God and for those around us. It should be an, uh, an imitation of God's love for us as we lay our lives down for those around us, whatever relationship or situation that might be in. But then we see coming into the rest of the passage, the fact that God's love is at the heart of all this, really. And the Bible portrays it, doesn't it, that our love is perfected when our love meets his love. There's no way that you can have true biblical love without first receiving and understanding and living in the love that God has for you. And so let's remind ourselves of that just as we finish this morning. The Bible says we love him because he first loved us, because that's the only way to do it. When you know his love for you, when you know the security of knowing that nothing that God has given you can be taken away from you, that you are his child and nothing can change that. When you know the reality that his love will never uh, wane or, or grow less for you, it will always be complete. When you know that security, it's then that you're set free to love other people. When we're all about protecting ourselves, protecting what we've got, looking after number one, uh, even looking after our relationship with God and making sure that we're doing enough to please him. When we're in that place of insecurity, we'll never love other people properly because we won't be able to, because our eyes are always inward. But when you realize the love God has for you, your eyes can go outward, inwards dealt with, you, you're saved. You belong to him. Nothing can change it. You're on your way to heaven and nothing can stop you. Inwards dealt with. Who you are is dealt with. You're a new creation, created in Christ Jesus for good works. You're born again of the spirit. You're one of God's children. Inward is dealt with. And so we can look outward. And because we know God is on our side, we are able to become vulnerable. We're able to lay our lives down. Even if sometimes people walk all over them, we're able to love as God has loved us. Shall we pray? Father, thank you for your word to us. And Lord, I just pray that you would be helping us even right now to understand the things that we've read um, together. I pray first and foremost, you'd help us to have a deeper understanding of your love for us. Lord, thank you that your love is unconditional and it's everlasting. Nothing can change it. Nothing can make it any less. Nothing can take it away from those who've trusted in your son. And I pray, Lord, that you'd help us more and more to live in that place of security, that place of rest, knowing that our eternity is secure. We belong to you. You are our father and nothing can change that. And Lord, as we are drawn deeper into that place of security, help us to lay our lives down for those around us or teach us what that means. Give us the wisdom we need to, to know what that even looks like in our own situations and help us, we pray, to lay our lives down just as you laid down your life for us, that we might bring you great glory in all that we do. Lord, again, help us to receive what you might say to each one of us and help us to respond, we pray in Jesus name. Amen.